Take a second. Take a second. All right. First, we have Alejandro who's going to read. Alejandro de Acosta is a teacher, writer, and translator, still in no particular order. His most recent teaching includes private tutoring in literature and philosophy. His most recent writing includes a manuscript of poems and a novel, finally. His most recent translations include poems by Macedonio Fernandez, Alberto, Alberto Laiseca, and Paulo De Jolly. Alejandro lives in Gainesville, Florida. Please welcome Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be able to start this off. Um, so I'm I'm going to read from one of the poetry manuscripts I've done this year, and uh, it's 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 one of the ones you just heard about. This is from a book called Poemas Chinos, Chinese Poems by Alberto Laiseca. And uh, briefly, the story with these poems is that Laiseca was mainly a novelist but he wrote a novel uh, set in ancient China. And uh, as, as part of his imagination there, he wanted to include uh, poetry that would be cited by the characters. And he had to ask himself whether he would translate uh, uh, Chinese poems or use existing translations of Chinese poems in his novel written in Spanish, of course. Uh, um, or, or whether he would write new ones, and he decided to write new ones. So um, the, uh, inside the novel, there are these uh, uh, fanciful, uh, imagined ancient Chinese poems. And Lysica had such a good time with this that he, even after the novel was done, he kept writing Chinese poems. And so his only book of poetry is this book called uh, Poemas Chinos, Chinese Poems, which I'm going to share some of. And as it's presented, um, it reads like an anthology. So each poem uh, at the end has, as you'll, as you'll hear as I read them, it has a, an author and uh, where that author lived. Okay. Foreign Devil. My emperor fell in rebellion against the false emperor in the month that smothers spring. My beloved blackbird served as a shield that same day. And yesterday, years later, but at the same ominous time, someone crushed my tabby cat, the patriarch of my cats, who would sit in the sun like a wise, irritable Buddha. Marco Polo, my friend, that foreign devil names the months in his strange barbaric way. Death, with its dishonor, changes me into a landless intruder. I would like to die in April beside my friends. Seng Feng Si Yuan Dynasty. Middle Kingdom Chess. In my land, there's a cannon in chess. It doesn't just attack the enemy, never something so direct. It takes an intermediate piece as pretext, regardless of whether it is an ally or invader. Because the cannon is not for shooting at the walls, but over them. Thus deaf, didactic, and empty, with a mandarin cap, imposes its doctrine from heaven above. There is no queen, save one who shows her jade bone. Festive, 
black towers, in combat against others in funerary white. Taoist monks drink tea, and at the end of the rite, between small cups, kill each other while the service remains intact. The kings, imprisoned in tiny palaces, can't even see each other. To overcome the rival shame means the loss of the kingdom. One who succumbs to feminine temptations is not worthy to reign. Each king has two guardians, like him prisoners of the palace. They fight on diagonal corridors among austere hierarchies. It's an immemorial palace tradition that superiors and subordinates going out to combat find relief in death. Ahead of it all undulate lines of horses and warriors. This is the body of my people, the Great Wall. So long as its center exists, the king will be able to last in the city of heaven, sheltered under the fold of his dragon. Huang Ti, we are your heart, and we beat like a dome. You are the source of our wisdom, the meaning of our love, tradition, and service. Chuang Cheng Tzu, Qin Dynasty. Origin of bad art. Separating color from shape implies mutilation of both and their transformation into demons. From this bad art arose the 10,000 aberrations without bodily center and without soul. The order of chaos won't excuse it. The ordering is not yours. You stole it from the harmony between heaven and earth. Chiang Chia, Duchy of Sin. The Collapse. Through the magic lantern, I peer at the ceremonial costumes that it shows. Curtains, mosses, and prisms represent imperial treasures. But long ships have arrived, and the dynasty collapses. They bring large lenses that blind our sight, and their horns thunder in our ears. What foundation will keep supporting the center? 10,000 times cursed be the foreign devils. Li Feng Qing Dynasty. A phrase that demands reverence. Wu, the harsh princess, demanded a song, wishing to satisfy her many had died. But the prize is great, it's her own hand. For the prospect of her festive smile, one dies after another. A young poet sang, strong and vigorous, despite his beginner's mistakes. Princess Wu smacked her lips like a Chinese death, punish the audacity of singing badly. Like a game, with joy, she handed the young man to her executioners for them to render him a bloody child. A grown man, a warrior sang next. With much wit, he transmuted his battles to poetry. I liked your song a lot more, but not enough. I will show you the mercy of nature. When have you ever heard the hungry wolf is cruel? Give him a quick death. But breaking from her guards, he threw himself into a chasm, strumming his body over the harp strings of the rocks. She shook her head in a strange gesture. Falling, he made music, but even so he does not convince me. Ready, a burnt offering for him, but not for his body, which is now being destroyed by the little silk washers. Burn a paper image, write first his name on it. Thus he will have a double death, like the abrupt end of a second dream. Dress him in full armor and bury him. In this way, he will mix with iron, and little by little, he'll acquire the fortitude that he lacked at the final moment. At last, a wise harpist came. 
The musician dared to look at the young princess Wu. She was motionless, and yet she painted boings with lacquer. The artist smiled. She said, A young man of 20 is very stupid. In his conversation, there is always dissonance or unexpected noise. A 30-year-old man is even dumber. He pretends to surpass me, but he is not old enough. I think I've seen you before. In any case, a man of 40 is a senior, too old. How, how could he touch my heart? You must sing three times better than the center of the others. Pronounce then the phrase that compels me to reverence. They died for not understanding soon enough, Princess Wu, that you, beneath your clothes, are naked. Shenkusi, Kingdom of Chu. Cunning courtesy. Silence is mandatory, but in the depths of their hearts, the people don't forget. My emperor has sunk down into dry branches and yellow flowers. The cunning of the enemy is unmatched. They toss no torches, fearing that the fire would grow and never go out. New Ping Chen Dynasty. Cunning lack of courtesy. Beings with broken souls falsify and vitiate, corrupting the vision. They erect a hundred walls to render difficult access to the great unanswerable, the way to the defender of the biological. Many times they walk briskly upon the dreams of the old emperor. How great the need to erase the path, how tremendous the importance given to reviving his dead armies, to kill them again and again. He's the master of the past, and his venerable shadow will never be refuted. He's between the ice and the northern mountains, represents the four ways and the eight parts of the persistent cycle. His heartbeat doesn't stop, and someday he'll come down to meet the respect and affection of his loyal followers. He will lead us back to victory. New Ping, Chen Dynasty. Biological wisdom. Among the people, biological wisdom survives intact. Were it not for the vulgar people, we would have perished long ago. The secret unity between true men and a part of the people has allowed us to conserve what little we have. Fu Din Chi, Chen Dynasty. Fire on the mountain we call great. Marshes, floating mists, remains of bonfires left by hunters, a vermilion among the branches of the forest and the dull thunder of the earth. I cross the final cordons of the forest. Below, beyond the chasm, is the great mountain, the volcano. Molten sand, like a breath, climbs at regular intervals and then falls. When the red liquid rises, it blows huge bubbles, white and yellow bubbles. When collapsing, the protuberances burst into thick shards. The gold and crustaceans on that hillside resemble rows of imperial tombs. I no doubt is the devil, but I can't help wondering if this mountain, called Great, will someday fade away. And this one has a slightly longer attribution. Extremely secret poem attributed to Ti Yao, recently discovered in the excavations for the construction of the palace citadel Santai, transcribed into modern Chinese by Te Po, archivist, Chu Dynasty. A poem after reading your maxims. How you've changed since the times of Yao's poem. 
Here there are no more jungles, and the highway passes confidently, insolent, undaunted under the great mountain. A volcano is like a dynasty. When it dies, it dies forever. Now they've all passed, swept away by the people who no longer need them. Today, another mountain, that of the Eastern Spring, illuminates the Chinese nation. Hair, snowy iron, endless glory, the hot summer afternoon lives on. I will soon voyage into the old volcano after climbing the dorsal stones of its body. I cross the grottos of the terrifying basalts. As it retreated, the fire left bubble-shaped petrifications. The rocks scarring closed up the chamber where between breaths the burning masses collapsed. There, a waterfall of molten stone, cracked by the cold, is now transformed into hundreds of long prisms. Only yellow orioles could compare to that golden intensity between two golden grays. Only the birds or the sealed sarcophagi of Ming. In spite of everything, thanks to the basalt incrustations, there is another color floating, a general red, incorruptible and without error, like the chromaticism of thousands of flags or a long march. The thought of our president from the center of the Middle Kingdom ebbs and flows forever and ever, day and night, without beginning or end. Your magisterium is posed on the terrace of domination. A billion spokes has the center of your wheel. Among those purple yellow stones, once hot and that sank with a sigh, dynasties were precipitated forever. Yao's premonition is fulfilled. But now I ask you, president and source, who will have the strength to achieve the impossible, the fall of your people? Huang Tao, People's Republic. The Stagnation. Hare, spring of the east, how great is your error. Rather than let yourself be led by the gang of four reactionaries, your retirement and your poetry would have been preferable. Seven bad heads intoxicated yours. Where is the industrialization? Where is the modernization of the countryside? Why do your armies prosper with primitive weapons, helpless against the two imperialisms? From the recovered papers, of Comrade Fang, killed during the Cultural Revolution. Okay, I think we'll we'll leave it there. Thank you all for listening. Oh, Andro, thank you so much. Okay. And... Uh, next up, we have Jennifer S. Chang. Uh, Jennifer S. Chang's work includes poetry, lyric essay, and image text forms, exploring immigrant home building, shadow poetics, and the interior wilderness. Her hybrid book, Moon, Letters, Maps, Poems, was selected by Banu Kapil for the Tarpulan Sky Award and named a publisher, Publishers Weekly Best Book of 2018. She is also the author of House A, selected by, by Claudia Rankin for the Omnidon Poetry Prize, an invocation, an essay, an image text chapbook published by New Michigan Press. A former National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow, she has received awards and fellowships from Brown University, the University of Iowa, San Francisco State University, the U.S. Fulbright Program, Kundiman, Breadloaf, McDowell, and the Academy of American Poets. Having grown up in Texas and Hong Kong, she lives in San Francisco.
Thank you for that, Edie. Um, and thanks to the program and Jay for having me and just for the conscientiousness of the program. I really appreciated that. Um, I thought I would start by reading a few poems from my first book, House A, which was published in 2016, um, because the, the class I'm teaching on Saturday is writing letters to ghosts, and it invokes a, a kind of field um, in which to overhear or attend to um, or really just be with a specter that haunts your writing. Um, and this class sort of stems from my experience writing um, these this series of epistolary prose poems in this book addressed to uh, Chairman Mao Zedong, um, who was in my childhood household, um, like this very elusive, ephemeral, but strongly present um, ghost. Uh, so I'll just read a couple from, from here. Dear Mao, for one day I shall have the ability to convey the feeling of sleep, which is a feeling of dreams, stories, nightmares, and sometimes absolutely nothing. If sleep were a language, it would not sound like nothing, but would instead materialize both longing and distance history and myth. What I learned from my parents was the feeling of water, where all knowledge comes not in stories, but in the tone of one's childhood, or the mood of a Saturday afternoon, or the sound of something boiling over when one is not looking. On the porch of our Texas house, I noticed that the summer evenings were quiet with the sound of large insects and crickets, which also sang longingly under my bed whenever I opportuned to wake in the middle of the night. The language of our home was similar to yours, though smoother like glass and easier to tuck away. It is important to note that before language, children experience memories as image and sound which is to say they experience them as poetry. Dear Mao, I hope you understand that what I am doing is trying to give you a history of water, which like memory and sleep is fluid and wafting and refracted light. History as water so that I am giving you something that spreads. Dear Mao, Behind the fog, the lake is like a well-worn sheet gathered at the edges. What does it mean, my father as a child, believing he would have to lie his body still at the bottom of a boat? Dear Mao, I used to be the kind of person who accepts things as they are, ciphers hidden in the lotus cakes, lanterns set to sea in order to lure the body home, rice bundles to keep the fish from eating holes in a drowned body's limbs. Our home in the south of the island slept between the ocean on one side and on the other large dark hills, so I could always know what it was to be at the same time cocooned and ready to arch a distance. How I would brush my teeth in the darkness, afraid of the shadow at the window, but comforted by the slopes I knew were lurking behind. Dear Mao, I never wanted my mother's body too far from my own. Um, and then I thought I would actually read um, from an in-progress manuscript. Uh, it's called, tentatively, it's called um, Parachutes Unresolved Fragments. Um, and I don't usually read from in-progress work or really even talk about it, but I, I'm experimenting with letting myself be seen in a state of messiness. Um, and, and I think also I'm more and more, I am convinced that process and practice is not only supportive of, but in itself is the truth of artistic endeavors. Um, and this is just a small way I think of living into that. Um, so this manuscript is it's lyric nonfiction 
um, maybe a little bit of auto theory. Um, it centers around uh, racial melancholia, which is this psychological, sociological theory described by Anne Anling Chang um, in her book, The Melancholy of Race. And I also should say that visually throughout the manuscript on certain pages, there is like a, a little space that is framed by um, curly braces, those parentheses that kind of have a curl to it. Um, so that's just sort of a visual uh, aspect of the, the project. Um, I'll just read a little bit from the beginning. A body sometimes begins like this, the need to catalog its wounds. If I store it in the body like a grocery list, if I store it in the body like how weather absorbs into the skin, if it becomes a part of my fingers, always in startled gestures, or my shadow consistently taller, more insistent than my actual limbs, if the body has no language, I will draw circles like bruises of clouds. When we think of parachutes, we think of something billowing, opening up to save our bodies from impact. When we think of language, we think of our mouths round and parted. With a parachute, you are falling slowly, but still you are falling. What if I gave to you a collection of words, silence, absence, erasure, disarticulation, estrangement, unlocatable, illegible? What if I gave to you a small sequence of photographs, diagrams, and illustrations, an old faded square of my mother as a child, grainy and creased in the corner, one of my silhouette in the doorway of my grandparents' flat in Meifu, a Xerox of a linguistic diagram of a throat edged by a grainy rectangle of inverted light? What if I added to this a handful of tiny seashells that are too small to sound when you hold them to your ear? If I say I moved to a small Midwestern town when I was a girl, and I mean 23 years old, if I say I moved to a small Midwestern town in the middle of a hostile field, and I mean I didn't know, invisible wars happening in the field, always happening everywhere, and I didn't know even as I knew. If I say I moved to a small Midwestern town to study the accumulation of language that is my voice, and I mean there was debris, the boy I had married one week previously whom I had known since childhood, our apartment half underground at the edge of town, how we tried to start our life in swallow geographies, how one day I would go back and try to map the geometry of my insignificant body, the dark spot in its mouth, its soundless navigations in the nocturnal breadth. Another way to begin would be after we were married, we moved away to the Midwest where the wind carried the smell of nearby farmlands and the air was filled with tiny insects. In the Midwest, small winged bugs kept flying into my eyelashes. I could feel them when I blinked. Another way to begin would be, when I was a child in Texas, I was like a tempest at home, but mostly mute in school or places outside the house. In my first memory of being alive, I hid behind my mother's skirt, believing if the stranger couldn't see me, I wouldn't be left behind. Another way to begin would be, when children find themselves suddenly surrounded in a new language environment, they first begin with home language use. This is then followed by a nonverbal period where they cease to speak at all. For years, I left it alone in the corner, in the dark, where it had begun. I let it grow, a quiet mold over its shape like a winter coat, a heavy quilt, a tepid hill under which a murky creature hibernates. The humiliation of a child who notices she does not matter or exist to those around her makes the sound of what? A bird flapping its wings against the facts of night. Or... I felt my body as a frozen lake under which deep-throated hums of whales could still be heard sounding from far away, but as ice cracking. 
How many echoes does it take to get from point A to point B if the geography is full of invisible holes? My mouth like a child, afraid. The imagined sea like a child, afraid. Observable light inside a container like a child, afraid. Lines of air through ridges of tissue like a child, afraid. Folds of stalks and stems like a child, afraid. Eyes adjusting to the dark like a child, afraid. Continents shedding their edges like a child, afraid. The body touching the couch that is touching the floor that is touching the earth like a child, afraid. Maps carefully marked out in red ink. Words circled, lines drawn repetitively across a page. Map number one is the social function of language. For example, sender and receiver. The linguistics professor draws a connecting line, arrows. She delineates the differences between communication, speech, and language. In the room are students who do and who do not already know these distinctions. Map number two is the cultural environment in which language occurs, the subtle clashing of differing rhythms, where the pauses go, how long they last. For example, turn taking, turn signals, deference politeness system. In intercultural communication, person A might be accustomed to deferring to the person who is talking until they signal they are finished. Person B might continue to talk because person A has not claimed her turn. Map number three is the migration pattern of flying insects, dandelion seeds, and other winged species converging and diverging to form a textual surface in midair. And I'm going to stop there. I don't know if you can hear the, the storm happening outside my window, but <laughs> it's, it's loud. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Amazing reading. Thank you. Next up, we have Vicky Now. Vicky, Vicky Now is the author of many books and is known for her work spanning poetry, fiction, play, film, and interdisciplinary collaborations. Her forthcoming novel, The Italian Letters, is scheduled for publication by Melville House in 2024. In the same year, she will release a co-authored manuscript titled The Six Tones of Water with Sun Young Shin through Ricochet. Recognized as a former Black Mountain Institute fellow, Vicky now received the Jim Duggan's PhD Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Prize in 2022. Please welcome V. Hi, everyone. Um... I hope you're having a wonderful evening. Um, and um, I, well, I guess I've read both with Alejandro um, and Jennifer before. So um, it's nice to be reading with them again. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from my manuscript called Radiant Paralysis. And um, one translation from uh, um, Mat Tự, um, a poet in Vietnam who had uh, leprosy. So um, I'll start there. Radiant paralysis. In your dude bath smile, youth unfolds fragments of myself, a story yet untold 
Ho Chi Minh's art from war did arise, and I from my father's lecture found art in disguise. From the wide basin, Ding Bing Fu embraced pet offensive echoes in my creative space. Aged rice fields cost less, yet they thrive. A lack of bow of rice, a domino theory alive. Peasants toil, straw hats shading the heads. Archival release of fire, history spread lethal. I've become a city elevated high, fueled by a song, country spirit won't be denied. Arranged marriage of airlift and rice village charms. Oh, Providence, a tapestry of history armed French control, birth control, intertwine. I want my heartbeat 14 kilometers aligned. From your rice field, spice with me and grenade. A love song emerges. Explosive art display, a symphony of flavors, spicy, salty, and true, a union of passion between you and you. I can't hold the echo from falling down into the pillar of homelessness I drown. My shirt tattered in the storm's embrace. Your grace lingers, refusing to erase. I wish the mounting holes remain bare. No defoliated abyss can fill the air. You crave distant longing for the edge. While I yearn for the well to cleanse this pledge. My yellow shirt, devoid of its buttons hole, washed away in the well, stories untold. Let the ravine survive, carry our desire. No B-side to our digestion, only the fire. A-side the parasite paradise we share. In my impaired half-dreamed, I'm aware the hollow well mistaken for my voice. In this half-empty room, we make our choice. And then I'm going to read from my um, translation of um, Hang Mạc Tử, his poem. Um, they told me that, but yeah, I'm going to read it in Vietnamese and then I'm going to read you my translation of it. Sao anh không về chơi thôn vị, nhìn nắng hằng câu nắng mới lên, vườn ai mướt quá xanh như ngọt, lá trúc che ngang mặt chữ điền. Gió theo lối gió mây đường mây, dòng nước buồn thiêu hoa bắp lây, thuyền ai đậu bến sông chăng đó có chở chăng về kịp tối nay. Mơ khách đường xa mắt thường xa áo em trắng quá nhìn không ra ở đây xương khối mờ những ảnh ai biết tiền ai có đậm đà Here in Georgic vị dạ Won't you come visit Georgic vị and gaze at rows of newly awakened light mounted on the areca trees and satiny garden burden as shade, as bamboo foliage hyphenates and shades the fields. Wind bands with wind, cloud with cloud. The river glides sadly while the cornflowers swayed. Whose boat perches on the moonlit river? Will it escort the moon back in time tonight? Musing of far away travelance, far away travelance. 
Oh, darling, your blouse is so insomniately white, so insomniately disguised. Here the smoke smear fog blurs the sep mine or yours, whose love has more inami is more profound. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. B, thank you so much. Wonderful reading. Let's give another round of applause for Alejandro, Jennifer, and V. So tomorrow night, um, we will have our second reading. And that will be at six o'clock. Adi Steckel, Sarah Sutter, and myself will be reading. Um, tomorrow morning, um, Alejandro and I will be talking about voice. Thanks, you all. Great first day. Have a good have a good evening. <laughs>